Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to be talking about penetration testing in higher ed, which I realize higher ed's a little bit of a tough sell for a security crowd. There's a lot of discussion amongst the security community about how and why higher ed is maybe not doing the best job. And I think it's worth taking a deeper look at. So a little bit of a background about myself. Uh, uh, just one second here. There we go. So a little bit of a background about myself. Uh, I'm currently teaching at the Rochester Institute of Technology where I have a pretty um, significant influence on curriculum. But I've been in higher ed for 10 years uh, at a number of different kinds of universities. So RIT is a doctoral granting university. Before that, I was at one of the state schools in New York, which uh, did BS, BS degrees and some S degrees. And I also adjuncted at a community college for a little bit. Um, so I've kind of seen how tech is dealt with at a number of different kinds of universities and how that comes into play when we actually want to look at doing pen testing education and what might be some of the better ways to approach it. Is your handle really nerd proof? Nerd prof. <laughs> and yes, it is. Okay, so a little bit of a background about higher ed, which I think a lot of people don't really understand when we when you hear some of the complaints about higher ed it's well why don't we teach people x why don't professors stay up to date you know etc our basic unit of work is a three credit hour undergraduate course and that holds true for both students and professors that represents or is intended to represent about 10 hours of work per week for students about three in a classroom and about seven hours outside of a classroom on readings and assignments in order, typically, in order to graduate in four years, students have to take five of these a semester, which, if you're doing some math, already puts them at overtime, right? That's 50 hours a week on courses. Um, so that's a lot of work. And typically, you're looking at 120 credits to graduate, uh, 40 courses. And of those 120 credits, liberal arts schools often cap their majors, that is, the number of courses you can take in your major, at about, six, about half of the classes. So seeing liberal arts and CS and understanding why, or seeing uh, CS taught in liberal arts schools and tech taught in liberal arts schools, you tend to see a lot of different things being done. And to be frank, a different kind of student often comes out of those with a very different kind of skill set than the sort of students who are coming out of programs at dedicated tech universities. On the professor's end, um, a single course typically looks typically looks like eight to nineteen hours of work per week, depending on a number of factors like have you taught the course before? How often do you need to update the materials and so on? Um, what kind of grading do you do? What kind of assignments do you offer? But you're looking at like anywhere for one course, you're looking at eighteen eight to nineteen hours of work per week. Now, when you actually take a look at course loads at community colleges. Uh, where you have most most uh, professors at community colleges are adjuncts, but you'll see some tenure track, and there the teaching load is five to six courses per semester. At a sing at any given time, you've got one person teaching five to six classes, if each of which takes eight to nine eight to nineteen hours of work. That is an enormous workload, um, and so on. And so, so it kind of goes down the list too. Four year four year universities, four to five courses per semester, that's still a significant workload. Pretty much the only place where um, you see faculty not having a pretty high workload is research faculty at research universities. And they're, they don't need, they're really judged not so much on teaching. They do some teaching, but it's mostly seminars, graduate courses, that sort of thing. And they're really there to bring in grant money and to, to put out papers and do research and increase the profile of the school. Okay, So when we talk about why things are the way they are in higher ed, a huge portion of the issue is workload. 
And that's going to tra what that's going to translate to is um, in the field is that or what that's going to translate to for students is that in higher and more rapidly evolving disciplines, it's going to be harder to keep material up to date. I mean, it is updating a single class in a single semester is a challenge, um, given these kind of workloads. Which is not to say that most professors complain about these. I mean, academia has a lot, it, there is a high workload, but it has a lot of other perks too. So don't interpret this as me just bashing academia as being a terrible environment. There are a lot of other perks besides, um, you know, an easy workload. But the other place that a lot of people, this is sort of one of those, this is how the sausage gets made kind of things. People don't understand where curriculum comes from. In fact, I kind of saw this up at one of the lightning talks earlier. There was a gentleman who was talking about um, how he could, he had just got, he was just getting back into academia and he was kind of interested to see how could he take his experiences um, in the field as an IT person and get them into the curriculum in some way. So the curriculum is, I don't want to say rigid, because you'll see very, a lot of variance in curriculum, but there is kind of this core, and it comes from, for security, it comes from one of three, three places. Uh, ACM, that's the Association for Computing Machinery, pushes down some recommendations. If you want to see what more, a more detailed look at what those recommendations are, I gave a pretty in-depth talk in the same track last year, talking about, that kind of broke down how CS, IT, IS, and CSEC all taught security in different ways and what the requirements within those degrees look like. And some of them are ludicrous, which I'll come back to in a minute. So ACM uh, generates recommendations. They just put out a new cybersecurity recommendation called CSEC 2017 that they spent two or three years making. If you read it, it is CISP. They, they reverse engineered CISP. Um, and I'm not going to bash CISP because I actually think it has, I do think it has value, assuming people understand what it's supposed to be. But it's, mis it's often misinterpreted. So ACM puts out these recommendations and says, this is what we think a, a degree ought to look like. They don't verify that. ABET verifies that. They put out their own curriculum that they do verify. Uh, they call it accreditation. There's some variance in the curriculum, but that curriculum that ABET puts out and that they verify does, is heavily influenced by the ACM recommendations. Uh, and finally, there's this other thing that's kind of being done in parallel specifically for security, and that's NSA designations. They have two different designations, cyber defense and cyber operations. Cyber operations is really their offense one. And again, I had a lot of thoughts on that in my last year's talk. It, there's still a requirement that students need to be, come out of that writing, being able to write Telnet in assembly with no external libraries. In a four-year program, yeah. There's a, there is one very specific use case for that. If you're not making, like, implants, I don't know what it is. I don't know what, I mean, I guess it teaches you assembly, but whatever. Uh, there is no practical difference between an accreditation and designation. The only uh, difference there is is in how universities treat these. Universities like to promote accreditation. They don't really use the language. It's like us talking about cyber. Yes, we know that cyber has no meaning. No one here at meaning, but we still have to use it anyway. Uh, NSA really should start calling themselves calling uh, their stuff accreditation because designation doesn't have a lot of meaning in higher ed. Uh, but interestingly, NSA was the prime mover and has been most widely adopted, particularly the cyber defense uh, curriculum, which actually is pretty good. Okay, so that's where the curriculum uh, about security comes from. So when we look at pen testing and how pen testing kind of draws, uh, how, if we want to teach pen testing, this is what we have to start thinking about. What skills are our students supposed to be getting and where, they're where are they supposed to be getting those skills from? So where students actually learn security, um, overwhelmingly they get their, their security out of a CS degree, an IT degree, an information systems degree or a, C or a CSEC degree. That covers almost the entirety of this chart. With overwhelmingly um, computer science being the dominant field. And that's also where the most programs are, but that's where most students are encountering cybersecurity. And if you look at NSA designations, most of those NSA designations are for 
uh, computer science programs. Now, one of those thing, interesting things about the computer science program is the computers, the ACM recommendations only require one to, uh, I'm sorry, three to nine instructional hours on security and a bachelor's degree. So that's one to three weeks to learn everything you need to know about security in order to be a developer. What? Yeah, it, it's covered, right? You can check off the box. But I think they, if I remember correctly, I might be wrong about this, um, they specifically say you, you've got a maximum of three hours to learn everything you need to know about crypto. Yeah, it, it gets weird. So if we break down what, this, what skills students actually need to do pen testing, right? So I do have some, some differences here. So when I say networking principles, I mean that's abstract concepts. Routing, um, how, what IP is, how TCP works, how, what are protocols, the OSI model, DOD model, etc. Network administration is actually how to sit down and configure a router. Okay, so I'm differentiating those. Uh, same thing, I'm differentiating Linux and Windows for a, Windows and Linux for administration for a couple of different reasons. So when you look at the, the skills that students act, that a student would need to actually go out in the field and do pen testing and do a pretty good, a pretty decent job at it, um, for the most part, they're not going to get those out of traditional programs. So CS kind of ticks off the most boxes, but all of those concepts are electives. You typically see those, those skills in elective classes, not so much in required classes. IT hits a lot of boxes too, um, with the exception of coding. Getting coding into IT programs is kind of a hard sell, particularly for students. A lot of students I've seen go from CS to IT specifically because they don't want to code. Information systems, um, it does require risk management, which is uh, one of the few that actually does. But beyond that, it's beyond that and networking principles and a focus more on, on soft skills. IS is not going to get people a ton of security. And CSEC, you'll notice again that this looks a lot like CISP. Okay, a lot like you would expect to see out of the CISP CBK. So, you see required networking principles. You do see crypto, okay? But if you look at the learning outcomes for the CSEC uh, curriculum, those learning outcomes are all analyze this, know that, discuss this. It's not do that, right? It's not the ability to sit down and write a piece of software or the ability to solve a problem. It's the ability to talk about some concept, okay? These are, there's a definite, focus, a definite focus on soft skills in the CSAR curriculum and not hard skills. So if we want to teach pen testing, and these are the set of skills that we're looking for as prereqs to teach students, if I were going to uh, have these as, pre, as prerequisite knowledge for a pen testing class, how am I supposed to do this when almost nobody meets, so actually, I'm, how am I supposed to do this when almost no one meets the requirements? What? Yeah, do OSCP, right? <laughs> yeah, OSCP is awesome. Uh, that approach does not work in higher ed at all. So the OFSEC solution works for its target audience. It has a target audience that is highly motivated. I mean, there's a, um, a certain element of, uh, yeah, street cred, right? OSCP carries some cred. Um, that was the hardest exam I've ever taken. Uh, and it's often paid for by employers, and your employers actually care if you pass and can impact your future career, whether or not you actually do, whether or not you actually do the work may have some kind of tangible effect. Um, but one of the reasons that this approach doesn't work is OFSEC, what OFSEC, the skill that people really get out of offensive security is not the ability to hack any one thing, right? It's self-reliance. Okay, it's that try harder mentality, which is okay. I mean, that's an important skill, but it doesn't work in higher ed because professors aren't really paid to lecture, right? We don't impart some secret wisdom anymore. Everything's openly available on the internet. Um, we do occasionally offer some valuable nuance or context or insight based on experiences, but for the most part, we are very much like tech support, okay? We are the tech support for education. When students don't understand something, they can come to us and ask questions rather than beat their head against the wall for two days 
trying to like deobfuscate some. Well, I won't go into that. Um, yeah, and uh, when it comes to higher ed too, the students on the higher end of the grade distribution. There's a very famous uh, Bible grade, grade distribution that I'm going to get to in a minute. They will generally succeed anyway. Okay, I could just give them a textbook and they'll come out being able to do the stuff. It's the students on the lower end of the grade distribution that we really provide value to. So asking help, providing help on assignments, debugging, that's the kind of thing that we, that uh, professors help with. And here's that, again, that very famous bimodal distribution. So this is from an, un uh, an unpublished paper, but it's famously cited even though it's not published, called The Camel Has Two Humps. It's the grade distribution of an introductory, I think, Berkeley computer science class in 2006. Now, this has changed a little bit since then. I would say that there are fewer, fewer C's and more B's now. So it's getting a little bit sharper. Um, but it's still, this pattern still holds. So if I want to teach pen testing, and this is what I'm up against, how do I how do I teach pen testing in this in this kind of environment where I can't go the offsec route, but nobody has the prereqs? So I I have to start thinking about my fundamental assumptions. So my fir the first fundamental assumption I rejected in coming up with this class, which by the way was a graduate class, was that I need to prepare the students in my penetration testing class to be penetration testers, right? Penetration testing is a hard skill. It's something that involves a lot of knowledge. And you're probably not going to come out of any one class with everything you need. You need to be able to pick up things as you go and pick up things fairly quickly. But it's equally important that people going to things other than, info, or other than pen testing understand pen testing. If you're going into risk management, you need to understand pen testing. If you're going into software development, you should know a little bit about pen testing. That's useful. Okay, so. I shifted the focus less, uh, less from getting students up to that point where they could hit the ground running on an introductory job and covered on, basically decided to cover, um, get everybody up to the same playing field and then have them um, kind of in some ways get the skills that they needed to uh, that they didn't have and apply them to pen testing. So. I looked at what prerequisite knowledge is the hardest to learn on one's own. Which of those things would be the hardest to learn, um, not from a textbook, not from, from Stack Exchange, et cetera. And that's what my focus was on. I also made the focus broad. I didn't want this to be a class about exploitation. I didn't want this to be, oh, step one, fire up Metasploit. Okay? So instead, I decided to just create an environment that permits the, uh, all the students on that level, on that grade distribution, to get different things out of the same course. Okay, so even if they're not going to come out of the class and be a pen tester, they still understand the things they need to about pen testing to do whatever it is they're actually going to go do in their real life. Now, in looking at how to do this, there were a couple of uh, heavy influences. So I'm the CPTC coach for our school. Uh, I did black team a year before for. Uh, CCDC, the Northeast CCDC, which was awesome. And I just, I was working my way through this, uh, through Tony Robinson's book. Uh, he's, if you're, follow him on Twitter, DA667, Building Virtual Machine Labs, which was fantastic. Uh, very, very useful. So I sat down and tried to figure out um, what do I actually need to do? So first, core methodology. Okay, you obviously need to, to be able to go through reconnaissance, go through enumeration, exploitation, et cetera, okay? But I didn't want this to rely on tools, so I focused on a live off the land approach, okay? In fact, students found that Metasploit, they used Metasploit almost not at all in this class, which was awesome, despite their trying. Um, there was a focus on how pen testing related to risk, a huge focus on reporting, and a significant, portion, a significant portion of the class was focused on dealing with issues of pen testing at scale, okay? Which is really a data management problem. Because you get dropped into an environment with, I don't know, 500 hosts, and you've got 
enormous nmap scans like how do you go back and make sure you did everything in a comprehensive way okay so teaching strategies i divided the students up into firms and they they worked in their firms for the entire semester they had to go through all of the phases of a, of a pen test down to they had to go through scoping a scoping meeting they had to actually do an external pen test they had to do an internal pen test they had to write reports realistic reports um, the environment had realistic challenges, which I'll talk about in a minute, a, realist, a reasonable scale, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. It wasn't just fire off Metasploit, uh, and at the end, or actually every week they had to present an update to their client. Public speaking was something I thought needed, really needed to be addressed, and they had to write realistic reports at the end of every one of their pen tests. Okay? Would be comfortable handing to a client. So the environment that I gave them to pen test had, there were about 80 hosts that the students could uh, attack. I actually added scope. There were 72 ho about 72 hosts in scope that fluctuated a little bit over the course of the semester. And the ones that weren't in scope but that they could see were pretty heavily monitored. And if they started hitting those, they got, a, they got an email from their client. Okay, And if they kept hitting them, which none of the students did, they would have started to see penalties coming through. Um, I gave them a realistic layered network, a DMZ with realistic firewall rules. So uh, there was no exposed SMB to the internet, for example. Okay, when they did the external pen test, they saw DMZ or uh, DNS. They saw SSH. They saw HTTP, HTTPS, and so on. You didn't see. Stupid protocols that nobody would actually put, or and or out of date systems that no one would actually put on the internet. Almost everything in the environment had up to date OS, AV deployed, and firewall rules. Uh, we had a sim, although that wasn't heavily integrated into the class. One of my favorite challenges was the WAFs that we put in. So there were a couple of web servers. In, in fact, let me hop forward. Um, there were a couple of web servers, www1 and www2, uh, www and www2 in scope. One was dvwa, the other was dvna, since I didn't have anything custom written for the class yet, and they were behind mod security. So if you've never tried to hit something behind mod security, you're not going to get through. It, yeah. Mod security? Uh, Mod security is a web application firewall. It, in this particular configuration, it acted as a proxy. So the actual, the, uh, the actual name www uh, resolved to the mod security box, which would then do input validation. And assuming it passed, the input validation would forward the HTTP request onto www. So it's got a standard set of core rules that, that you can just download off of GitHub, I think. Uh, and they're very good. Uh, so the students, when they saw DVWA, were like, oh, awesome, this is going to be easy. And then they beat their heads at it for 10 hours and realized that none of the injection worked. Uh, it, those hosts were still exposed, but they were out of scope. So the client had intentionally put vulnerable systems out of scope, which was a fun challenge. Um, so the DMZ had, uh, these were the set of things that were exposed in the DMZ. We had a few other things in the DMZ, but for the most part, that's what we were looking at. Be, uh, so the student was on this, this network that we call the NAT network, and there's a ton of stuff that lives on that, not just for my class, but for other people's classes as well. We had a router on that network uh, that the DMZ was behind, uh, and each, each of these hosts had, fi had firewall rules that only exposed the necessary services for that host. So SSH only had 22 open. Uh, mail only had 25, um, and I'm forgetting the IMAP and POP3 ports, um, et cetera. So they really couldn't hit too much there. Uh, R2, so the DM, uh, there was also R2, and the company's internal infrastructure was behind R2. Okay. And there we had. Uh, the TIS networks, that's their IT network where a number of IT devices lived. That's uh, where their AD environment lived. We had something like, they're not on this, but there was something like 20 Windows hosts on that enterprise network. Um, 
the garage network had a few older machines there. That's where the Windows XP boxes were, the things that would, would have aged out of the corporate environment. And the dev network was running your typical set of dev things. So we had Jenkins there, we had some CI there, um, and a few other, a few other um, applications. So and I've got a, a short, incomplete exploitation guide. So the first test they had to do was the external penetration test. And there, they had almost no results. Which was, I was, so I was got, this was actually pretty, I was actually really happy with how well they pursued this. Um, and also in talking with some people afterwards, in fact, I was just talking with, with somebody last night who was, who was sort of saying, external pen tests are just so boring because I never find anything. I very rarely find really interesting stuff. So there was a, a name server that permitted zone transfers. There was, the FTP server was running a vulnerable version of ProFTP but it only dropped you into a limited Docker container that had pretty much the only useful thing in there was netcat and wget. Um, the web servers were behind proxies. Uh, they were accessible at other IPs at a scope. The sort of intended attack path was to use Metasploit on ProFTP, which got you a limited shell, and then you could, dub, uh, you could wget, you could embed a, an exploit in wget fire it off at the command line to the mod, uh, to the, directly to the web server behind the proxy, thus bypassing, bypassing the proxy. Uh, and that's pretty much the only way to get a real proper shell in the environment. Um, RDP was exposed, so the, the fake company's CEO uh, had RDP exposed to the internet because he need to, needs to be able to get to his desktop from anywhere in the world. Um, that had weak creds, uh, which some people found. Nobody found uh, the unauthenticated root shell running on UDP 62000 on the SFTP server. So that was put there as part of an enumeration challenge. Uh, so a couple of VPN accounts had weak creds, and the mail server uh, permitted verify, which almost everybody got. On the internal test, uh, there were a number of web hosts that weren't, that I don't have in that diagram. They were all vulnerable, uh, including some nuanced vulnerabilities. So, for example, the Mod Security 1 host uses HTTPS. So, if you, if you send data to Mod Security 1, it's HTTPS. However, behind the scenes, it relays that behind the scenes over port 443 to the actual WW server. However, it's only over port 443, not actually HTTPS which requires some nuance to find and discuss um, the meaning of. But beyond that, you had a sort of a normal set of things. Weak creds, which when I do pen testing, that is my biggest find, are credential and authentication problems. There were also, uh, if you could get, if you could bypass R2, you actually had to bypass this, uh, R2 and pivot into the internal infrastructure in order to get domain admin. And there we had some processes running on, on uh, some of the machines in the garage network that would, that if you could steal the impersonation tokens on those boxes, you could, that's how you got DA. Um, and uh, we had a number of scripts with embedded credentials. So, some results. So, the report writing, the students did a fantastic job with the reports. Like, they just knocked these reports out of the park. They did a, a really good job. And they got the importance of the soft skills, which I loved. Um, for the most part, they were graded on how they presented the risk. I, don't, I, I didn't care so much about what they actually exploited. But what I cared about was how did they discuss the impact of their pen testing work to the business. And that's really what they were graded on. Um, they were graded on how, how well did they write different parts of the report for different audiences. So did you talk about H the HTTPS protocol without explaining it in the executive summary? That's not a thing you should do, okay? Uh, we looked at how well the reports relate back to the org's stated goals. So we gave, the organization gave them some initial goals during the scoping test. Um, and we also looked at how useful these reports would be in producing change. Yeah, okay. So few people got DA. Um, most of the students just bashed the web app, and students' biggest problems, as I think every pen tester can uh, get, are um, enumeration and pivoting. Those are always some of the biggest challenges. 
So I've got some future work. I'll just leave this up for a second so that the video captures it. Mostly what I really want to do is add depth to this environment with fake u uh, and um, embellish on the number of fake users and add some more realistic infrastructure. But overall, I was really happy with how things proceeded. So questions, I, which I don't think we have time for. If you have questions, ping me. Yeah, so so I think every dis I think every discipline can do this in some way. IT certainly has the lowest barrier to entry, but everybody can do this. In fact, there are, if back on that first slide there were some computer and there are some computer engineering schools, uh, some computer engineering programs that have these NSA designations. As far as pen testing goes, IoT really get, IoT device pen test. If you want to do engineering, IoT getting students into pen testing for IoT is going to be probably the the quickest way to get in because that's something that traditional pen testers have a hard time with given some of the hardware issues. So I think there's a niche there that, that CE can fill. Other questions? I think I need to hand it off. All right. Thank you.